Happy Sabbath and warm greetings to everyone today coming to the sources of Heavenly Redeemer to drink. Our new study bears the title It is the words of Jesus from the scripture Be ye perfect. God's will for us all is expressed in the words of Christ. Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In six days God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. We are expecting soon at the end of the sixth day, or millennium, at the time of the latter reign, that God creates a man in his image. It is the core of the plan of salvation, when God creates man free from sin and perfect in Christ, so that he can end his time of grace and leave him without a mediator to forgive his sins. Jesus had no mediator, so these two groups of 144,000 and the great multitude represented by Adam and Eve will not have a mediator in the last seven plagues. God's goal for his people is expressed in the following verses. For he that is dead is freed from sin, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. To be perfect, it means to be free from sin. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And what will happen when there would be no mediator? Whosoever abided in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. Man's ministry, or the ministry of iniquity, is set up against Christ's meditorial or intercessory ministry in heavenly temple, he says about it. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let it will let, until he be taken out of the way. Salvation from sin is possible only through Christ's daily intercessory service or ministry in the heavenly temple, that is, sanctuary. The little horn, or the man of lawlessness, brought down this truth to the ground and trampled the holy temple in heaven and led the people away from Christ's intercessory ministry in heaven. Lawlessness is sin. That is why this human priestly office, which cannot take away sin, is called mystery of iniquity, and its head chief is man of sin. The papacy has eclipsed this original temple in heaven, as well as Christ, the true high priest and head, and his mediatorial office in heaven, and established the office of Christ's vicar on earth. The Bible calls this ministry the mystery of iniquity because it cannot remove sin and cannot make a single person perfect. The great truth is that we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens 
a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. This truth is completely unknown to the Christian world today. The man of sin made it so. No earthly priesthood with earthly priestly ministry and sacrifice can remove sin and bring perfection. In the book of Hebrews, the apostle writes that even the temple established by God with its service and sacrifices could not remove sin. He says of it, The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure or an image for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the consciousness or relating to the consciousness. Christ is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? If the earthly Levitical priesthood established by God could not purge out sin, it means that no other earthly priesthood can do it either. What's more interesting, it actually perpetuates it. Thus the papal priesthood represents a deception and a counterfeit of Christ's priesthood. This priesthood is the mystery of iniquity and its head chief is the man of sin because by claiming to be able to forgive sins, he perpetuates them. Today, during the work of the New Testament heavenly temple, every earthly temple, even Solomon's, that they are intending to build, represents the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of sin, because it suppresses and abolishes Christ's ministry in heavenly temple, which is the only one that can give perfection. Opposite to the mystery of iniquity, there is also the mystery of God that Paul writes about. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known that it is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. This mystery declares that every man can be perfect in Christ. The heavenly sanctuary could not be cleansed until the believers were purged from sin. The sanctuary cannot be cleansed as long as, through the confession of the sins of the people and the intermediary service of high priest, the river of sin and transgression flows into the sanctuary and thus defiling it. The cleansing of the sanctuary represents the purging of all the records of sins that were written in it during the intercessory service. This river of evil and sin had to first stop at its source, that is, in the heart and life of the believer, before the sanctuary could be cleansed. Before the sanctuary can be cleansed, the cleansing of people has to be done. The precondition for the cleansing of the sanctuary is the end of transgressions and sins and bringing of eternal justice or everlasting righteousness into the heart and life of every believer. When the river of sin directed from the people to the sanctuary stopped flowing from its source, then, and not before, the sanctuary could also be cleansed of the sins recorded through the intermediary ministry of the high priest. When the time of grace is over and the cleansing of the people through the confession of sins and defilement of the heavenly sanctuary ceases, only then the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary can be done, and that is the sins which are written therein. The goal of Christ's first coming was to 
finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. By his holy life, Jesus put an end to transgression. By his death, he put an end to sin. And as a sacrifice for sin, he cleansed our iniquities. With his sinless life, he revealed the eternal justice and perfection that he gives to all who believe on him. Everyone who is in Christ should experience spiritual rebirth and victory over sin. The goal of Christ's high priest ministry is bringing eternal justice and his perfection into the lives of believers. As the children of the second Adam, we inherit his sinless nature by receiving the Spirit of Christ. In the priestly ministry of the man of sin and of the mystery of iniquity, the sinner confesses his sins to the priest and continues to sin. In this ministry, there is no power to overcome sin because even when a believer confesses his sin and receives forgiveness, he continues to sin. Unfortunately, many who believe in Jesus' high priest ministry, they confess their sins to him and carry on sinning. Is it suitable to equate the ministry of great high priest with the ministry of the mystery of iniquity? How does Christ's intercessory ministry lead to perfection and victory over sin? The core of Christ's first coming to this world was to, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Wherefore when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these things ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. From the Pentecost, Jesus as our high priest gives us his life so that we can live a perfect life without sin. We are the temple of the Spirit of Christ. At the outpouring of the early rain, Jesus gave his life, i.e. his spirit, in great measure, so that believers would live a victorious life. Since the Pentecost, the early rain is being poured out upon every believer who believes and seeks Christ's victorious life in order to overcome sin and live Christ's perfection, a life free from the power of sin. Early reign is given so that we can grow to the apostolic experience of sanctification and live a life free from the power of sin. From Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks or the early reign, the kingdom of heaven is within us. And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the days of the apostles was the early rain and many were converted and turned to God. However, the latter rain will be twofold because on top of the early rain that is still active today, another measure of the Holy Spirit will be poured out in the latter rain. Just as rain is important for a plant, so the Spirit of Christ is necessary for spiritual life. Just as early spring rains and late autumn rains are important for crops, so the Spirit of Christ is important for the advancement of God's work in this sinful world. 
Spring rains are important for plants to sprout and grow stronger, while autumn rains are important for the formation of rich fruit and filling of grains. The latter rain, which helps the grain to ripen, is a spiritual blessing that prepares the individual as well as the church for Christ's second coming. We can now be baptized in the fullness of the early reign of the Spirit if we make a complete and perfect surrender of our will to God and if we seek complete and continuous victories over all sin. Early and the latter reign are the same Spirit. The role of the early reign is complete and invincible victory over all sin and the role of the latter reign is to perpetuate and seal that victory forever without returning to the old and sinful way of life. The early rain is the abundant gift of the Holy Spirit, and the latter rain is the outpouring of the Spirit without measure that leads to the creation of man in God's image, who cannot sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Soon, when Sunday law is passed, the judgment upon the living will begin. Then believers who see complete and unbreakable victory over sin during this time, uh, now, that is now in early reign, they will be declared wise in judgment. When the latter rain comes, their victory over sin will be sealed by the giving of Christ's Spirit without measure, then he who is holy and righteous will remain holy and righteous forever. At the beginning of latter rain, each believer will receive Christ's Spirit with no measure, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Such believer will cease to defile the sanctuary through confession of his sins. First, it will be the experience of the wise virgins, and we find it in Matthew 25 and then of the other sealed ones during the latter reign, when the sealing of 144,000 of Jews and a great multitude from other nations will take place. Anyone who receives the latter reign will no longer defile the sanctuary through the confession of sin, because the stream of sin in his heart will be dried up, thus the river of sin that flows from God's faithful towards the sanctuary will soon be reduced, it will completely stop when yet the last believer repents, confesses and defiles the sanctuary through his confession of sin to Christ the High Priest. Then the time of grace and the ministry of Christ's intercession will end. By receiving both the early and the latter rain, even the last believer will gain complete victory over sin. Then all the faithful will be sealed and the unfaithful stand or mark. Just as in the shadow of the earthly sanctuary the cleansing was accomplished by removing the sins that defile the sanctuary, so must the true or actual cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary be done by removing or erasing the sins that were written therein. With the end of the sealing, Christ's ministry of imparting his spirit ends also, and so the need to defile the heavenly sanctuary through confession of sin because God's people will be created in God's image and will be free from sin. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Since the saints keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus with the completion of sealing, the defilement of the sanctuary ceases. Jesus speaks the words, He that is unjust, let him be and just still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Then the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary from recorded sins that have been acknowledged and overcome during the intercessory ministry can begin. Then comes the end of the time of grace and the end of the intercessory service, because there is no more need for it. Jesus changes his clothes and begins the service of cleansing of recorded sins in the sanctuary. In about half an hour of silence, that is the seven days, just before 
the seven plagues. When Jesus changes his clothes, God's people will no longer have a mediator in heaven to forgive their sins and they will no longer defile the sanctuary because there will be no need for it. They have Christ's perfection in them and cannot sin because they are born of God. Jesus' life was an experience of Daniel 9.24, which says to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. By his holy life, Jesus conquered sin. He took our body and ended transgression in it. He made an end of sins and brought in the everlasting righteousness. Now, as high priest, he puts his sinless life into all those who believe in him. All members of God's people on earth should have this experience. So, in our life and experience, these words need to be fulfilled, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. The everlasting righteousness is not righteousness for today and then sin for tomorrow, and then again righteousness, then sin. Such righteousness is not everlasting and it is not in the likeness of God, but in the likeness of a sinful man. It is sad if we equate the priestly ministry of Christ, Jesus, with the ministry of the man of sin and the mystery of iniquity, which cannot bring everlasting righteousness, but on the contrary, perpetuates sin. Thus, with our life of unrepentance and incomplete surrender to Christ, we disrespect his service in the heavenly temple and lower it to the level of mystery of iniquity. The everlasting righteousness which Jesus gives us is not righteousness for today or tomorrow, but forever. That righteousness is his sinless life, which we receive in fullness forever, becoming partakers of his divine nature. Thus we become the temple of Christ's Spirit for all eternity. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. We will have Christ's mind, wisdom, his thoughts and feelings in us through endless eternity. Thank God for his unsurpassed gift. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things, but the anointing which ye have received of him abided in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointed teacheth you of all things, and it is true, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Christ is truly our life, both physical and spiritual, for in him we live and move and have our being. He that hath the Son had life, and he that hath not the Son of God had not life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. The message for us all is, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. The Spirit of Christ should lead us to repentance and then to conversion from sin to eternal righteousness. Only then can sins be erased in a heavenly sanctuary and the person declared wise. After that comes the latter rain as rest in Christ from the bondage of sin bringing everlasting righteousness through faith in Christ Jesus and the cessation of sin and lawlessness in our lives is the ultimate goal of God's people at this time we are living in. Just then can Father send his Son to come for his bride, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. God's plan for us is, 
For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. May the Lord help us that this be your and my experience. May the Lord be with us all until our next fellowship. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember, will I remember no more. And their sins and iniquities will I remember, will I remember no more. Hebrews chapter 10, 16 and 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember, will I remember no more. And their sins and iniquities will I remember, will I remember no more.